Okay, everyone, uh, we have one minute to start, but I think we can go. So we are really, really proud to have James around, not just because of the knowledge and all of it, but because, as we said, for the itnext.io, our website, James was like one of the first person that was actually written uh, a lot of stuff there, and he gets a lot of visualizations from it, I think. And it was before you joined AWS, I think? Yes. Those previous days, if there was such a thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so now I'll give a very warm round of applause for James to talk about serverless again. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here. It's my first time in Amsterdam, and it's great to meet all the people from IT Next I kind of know on Twitter and through the internet, but it turns out that we're, we're real people too. So this is a subject I'm really passionate about, so I'm really excited to be here. It's basically about why serverless will revolutionize your software process. So my name is James Bezik, and I am a developer advocate for AWS Serverless. And I've been at AWS for about six months, but before that, I was a serverless geek, as I described myself, for about two years. And I've built lots of applications uh, at scale using only serverless components. So before this, I was a software developer for quite a long time, and then I was a product manager for quite a few years. And I like that middle spot where we find tools and ways of doing things that help solve customer problems quickly. So that's really how I ended up discovering serverless. I also worked for a lot of different startups over my years, as, long as, as well as big companies like Rackspace and USA and several others. And uh, I also like coffee in theme parks. Um, not coffee in theme parks, but when they're separate, they're okay. <coughs> so for this demo, take out your phones. We're going to need those a little bit later. We're showing off some things. But before we get into that, let's talk about Hello World. So you remember this one line of code that we all run? We learn a language, and it's the first thing we run. And it's kind of a rite of passage whenever you pick up some sort of new language. But have you thought about how difficult it is to run Hello World as, as a web app? So as an example, let's take a look at this. If I want to run Hello World on a web server, this is what I need. First, I need an instance or a server of some type. Then I need an operating system, Linux, Windows, something or other. Then I'll have to choose a runtime, and then a web server, and some code. And if you look at my code on the screen here, we've got some express code, and it's setting it up, and we've got some route handling and port listening and all sorts of good stuff. And I'm really just trying to run this one line of code right here, and it's sat up upon this massive stack of stuff that's going on. And so my business logic is just one line, but I have this overhead I have to carry with me all the time. <coughs> now, let's imagine we go to Hello World at scale. So um, I'm not sure there is a need for this service, but bear with me. So if I want to go to scale, it looks more like this. I now can't have one server because I need high availability, so I've got to have two, three servers in different regions. So I'm not even able to put them in the same building. They have to be in separate areas, availability zones in AWS parlance. And then I basically need to have some images of those servers because I've now got multiple of those. So that means somebody has to manage and maintain and feed and water those images. Then all these servers have to be inside security groups and VPCs. And it kind of just goes on and on and on just so I can scale up. Now, if I have more demand for Hello World than I imagine, it's po possible, right? Then I need to have the ability to scale up and auto scale those servers. That's not instant. But if I don't have the demand for Hello World I need, I cannot go down to one server because I still need the HA piece. So I'm going to have servers sitting around doing nothing. So this is kind of a, a, a big problem. And I've still come back to the fact that I just want to run Hello World. So the, the serverless approach helps developers focus on the code. And even though this is Hello World, this is what it actually looks like in the serverless world. So we have one Lambda function running my one line of code. And I put an API gateway endpoint in front of that so that you can reach it. And that's it. And in fact, I did this. I've been in Amsterdam for 24 hours. And this is the Dutch I've learned so far. So um, if you go to that URL, you'll be really impressed if the Wi-Fi lets us manage this to see James's Hello World. Now, what's interesting about this example, even though it's not really going to get any VCs that are interested at this point, is that Although there's for 100 people or so in this room, this would work if tens of thousands or millions of people went to this endpoint. So even though it's a, it's a really silly example in some respects, out of the box, you have automatic scaling. It just scales for you. 
um, you also have high availability. So if a region or if an availability zone where Lambda is running has a service disruption, it will automatically fail over to another AZ without me knowing or doing anything. No one will notice. And it's also really secure because I can make sure that Lambda function, the only thing it can ever do in this life is return that piece of code. And the API gateway piece, all it can do is call that lam Lambda function. So I can bake in security from the ground up. So this is the key to why serverless is so different. And you can focus on the business logic and not the machinery running underneath it. So this is something about that I like. It's really about simplicity. And serverless can make things just incredibly simple. So I want to focus on web apps for a second, because I know that's something that a lot of people at this conference and in this room really care about. If you look at a classic web app stack, this is what you've got. So you know, imagine this could be a LAMP app. For, you've got Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. And typically, you're switching out those with Nginx or something else. But when you build all of this, you then have all these other things to consider. You've got to think about vertical scaling. Did you have enough CPU and RAM to do what you want to do? What about horizontal scaling? You've then got to design machines. Is your app designed that way, where you can make sure that it can, it can go to any server? And if so, do you have load balancing in place, you know, the sticky sessions, all those things you've got to manage through load balancers? And there's availability, security, monitoring, yada, yada, yada. And in between doing all of this as a developer, you still have to find time to write features for your application. I mean, that's what your users care about. They don't care about any of this stuff. So we have all of this, this stuff we have to manage. And very quickly, in production, your web app starts to look like this. Now, this is a best practices reference architecture from AWS for WordPress, because it's one of the most popular applications on the web. But it could really be any type of web app. And most of what you're seeing here just handles availability, scaling, all of that good stuff, the machinery of running the app. And it's really hard to manage all of this without having a DevOps professional in the house. Uh, you need to basically have somebody available who knows how to monitor and maintain this infrastructure. So at scale, these server-bound technologies very quickly start to explode in complexity and become very difficult. So let's compare this to the serverless approach. So in this example, this could be a Spar app where you're running React or Vue or Angular or something. And with those frameworks, you take what you've written and it compiles down to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And you pick up those assets along with any images and media that you have, drop them in an S3 bucket, and then have it served by a CDN cloud front in our case. And the great thing about that is just out of the box, you've now offloaded 100% of your downloading problem serverlessly. You don't have any control over S3 servers or cloud front servers. And then your application, when it works, will then uh, call API Gateway for dynamic content, which then calls Lambda and all the other downstream services you might be using. Now, what's interesting about this is that everything in this diagram, compared to the last diagram, is related to the architecture of your application as a developer, <coughs> not the machinery of running it underneath. And out of the box, you have this global scale problem solved as well, because whether you have users who are in Australia or the US or here, they're still going to get similar types of latency performance, because that's also handled for you as well. In the background, you have load balancing handled for you by the CDN. CDNs are very good at that. And again, something you don't need to manage at all. So all in all, this is just really much, much simpler. OK, so before I went for AWS, you might have remembered I wrote this little article for IT Next that got a lot of traffic on the internet. And um, it was this. So the story behind this is there's a certain country in Europe that's trying to leave Europe. And there's a petition site where lots of people went online to vote about their opinions on this, and it crashed. And so I saw this, and I thought, well, this would be a good challenge to see if we could build a serverless petition site at scale. So I set myself a couple of constraints. The first one was that I only had an hour to write the solution. And the second was it had to be completely serverless. So I figured 5 million votes over three days, that's 86,400 seconds in a day. Do the math. It turns out to be about 20 votes a second at a sustained rate. So I put an egg timer on the desk, and I started building out my Lambda functions. This wasn't really given an hour. There wasn't much time for planning. I just wrote my yes function, my no function, cobbled together some bootstrap. I even forgot to take the lorem ipsum out. 
and there it is. And in fact, if you, you can go to this website now, vote.jbez.dev, dev, yeah, and um, it's still running. And I've not touched this in six months. There's been no patching or maintaining or anything. It just sits there and runs. So in the article, I wrote a long piece about load testing. I'm a big fan of load testing, and we've got tools like Artillery.js, which you know, everybody should use and love. And I showed at length how we did this 1,200 requests um, a minute over a long period, and how many 200s were getting back, and our P95s and P99s, all very good. You know. And what was great was that after a few days of this being online, the internet said no to my load testing and decided to load test it itself. And I only discovered this when I was checking the Cloud CloudWatch logs one day, and I discovered this. And over a one-day period, I suddenly started getting one million votes per hour. And I panicked. I was like, this is way higher than anything I had ever planned. And what, what happened was, it was fine. API Gateway scaled up, DynamoDB scaled up, Lambda scaled up. And apart from me checking the logs, I actually wouldn't have known this happened at all. So my few dozen lines of code, and the solution in the article really was pretty minimal, scaled up to millions of users uh, just by accident. So serverless can scale really well, especially in spiky load situations. That's my US alarm clock, because I'm on the wrong time zone. So um, <laughs> It can scale up in spiky load situations, but also when you don't know what traffic to expect. And increasingly, that's actually the world we live in. We're not quite sure how to scale up for the applications that we're developing. Now, when I built this voting solution, which um, you know, was not really that well thought out, these are the things I didn't have to do. And that's only a few of the things I didn't have to do. I actually have a version of this slide where the font's a lot smaller. And you think about all the things involved with managing servers at scale to handle this sort of stuff. Everything from HTTP certificates to YUM updates. I didn't have to do any of this stuff. It just, it just worked. Now, not all applications in the world need to scale. So how else is serverless useful? Well, a common challenge I've found as both a developer and a product manager in my life is that gathering requirements is hard. And typically, you have this question around, when do you know what to build? And it, are you in a company where you know at the beginning? Like, you've, you gather all the requirements at the start, and you know exactly what you're going to build, or at least you think you do, and you've got some sort of waterfall approach. <coughs> do you discover your requirements at the end? I hope not, but I've seen lots of people who work this way, where at the end of a project, that's when they know the most. Do you kind of feel it out long as you go? Are you discovering things that you should have known at the beginning and you know, berating people for not knowing more earlier? That seems to be fairly typical now. Or is it really a non-stop environment where you have features coming at you 24-7, there's no clear end to a project, you're simply a feature factory trying to keep up? And increasingly, I find that we're in these last two sections, that this is the modern IT environment, that we have all of these amazing ways of collecting requirements, but those benefits of Agile haven't necessarily flowed, flowed through to engineering to help us to figure out what to build. And the problem, this is because our customers now have faster changing requirements. We have shorter delivery cycles, faster release cycles. And so this isn't going away, and it's not going to change. But as you know, the early decisions we make in IT often cause inflexibility. And this is the technical debt we, we talk about. But how do we know what decisions to make when we know the least about the project right at the beginning? So serverless can help with some of these problems too. The first way it helps is there's a lot less code. So typically, I've, the projects I've worked in, you can find there's 50 to 70% fewer lines of code. And that makes a, a huge difference. There's less boilerplate for authorization, database management, um, all of the other stuff that, that we copy and paste from project to project. The second is that it promotes a microservices approach to building your app. And just inherently over time, you see that monoliths, although they're everywhere, are basically just less agile than microservices. Microservices are easier to split up into teams, especially when you work in larger, larger companies with more developers. It's just easy to farm out these pieces of work. And smaller chunks of projects tend to just evolve faster in terms of feature velocity. Also, we're now depending on services. So serverless applications tend to be a federation of services that do jobs for us. So we, we, allow, we enable ourselves to rely on 
um, th things to handle repetitive tasks like the authorization and database management. Also baked into the platform, you know, we have a lot of monitoring and logging and tracing and so forth that ends up being done for us. And then there's CICD. This is still a phrase that strikes terror into many organizations, but really all it comes down to is bringing automation around things that we make mistakes on. We can still release once every six months with CICD, but it's a way of bringing control around that process as well. And now with infrastructure as code, with tools like CloudFormation and serverless application model, as developers, we can now build out those pieces of the infrastructure we need and build them up and tear them down as we need. So what does a serverless application look like? So to understand agility, I think it helps to show what these applications can, seem, can look like. So you've probably heard of, of Lambda. Lambda is our functions as a code service AWS. It's often confused with serverless. Like people talk about serverless and Lambda in the same breath. But really, this is only the piece that manages your compute. And you provide the code. You pick the runtime you want to use. And we make sure it runs. And it doesn't matter whether you call that code once a year or 10,000 times a minute. It will run. And so Lambda can do cool things like this. So here is a node snippet that I have that takes a payload from an IoT button, which is one of these things. And what it does is it, it receives the event, packages up some JSON, and then throws it out to IoT Core so that anyone listening on that topic can do something. Now, every time this button is pressed, this Lambda function will be invoked. Now, this will, again, work whether I have one button or tens of thousands of buttons connected to this. In fact, it's the technology behind the Amazon Dash idea when you run out of toilet rolls or something in your house. You press this, and it places an order. The business logic behind that just focuses on the one person placing the one, the one order. So what's cool about this is that I've also wired up a front end to this thing, because why not? And if you go to that website, you'll see that we can test it out. So if I just make sure my Wi-Fi is turned on, you can see that basically every time I press the button, it will now increment a number, like it's a now serving number for a deli. And what's really cool about this is that we just built an IoT app in, well, there's, what, 17 lines of code there and probably 30 lines my front end. And now we have a fully scalable app that basically we could connect this button to a front end or it could open a garage door or turn on the light or anything else we feel like we want it to do. So a Lambda function can be triggered by anything, basically. It's not just IoT buttons. Any type of event you can think of, from uploading a file to an HTTP request or a scheduled cron job or another service provider or, or a SaaS partner or anything else. And it can interact downstream with anything within AWS or beyond, anything with a webhook or an HTTP endpoint or whatever you want to call. So in this thought process, Lambda starts to become more like glue or plumbing in our applications. It's not by itself serverless. So it becomes a mechanism for processing data from one place to another. Now, Lambda can interact with services like API Gateway and DynamoDB. Now, just by itself, this pattern here is a highly scalable CRUD interface. I could build a create, read, update, delete type database structure just by putting those three things together. That's basically what my voting app did, more or less. So just those three things, now we have this highly scalable, um, high throughput API. And there can be very little code. In fact, you could even take the Lambda out in some cases and just put those two services together. But this for, they can just as easily um, have the Lambda function store an object in S3. And then maybe you, S3 is triggered to uh, connect to CloudFront, so it would serve objects through there. Maybe there are images going into our S3 bucket that we want to be analyzed using a, f an, a service like Recognition. So the images could be um, analyzed to see what's in the photo that's uploaded. And then we drop the results back into DynamoDB. Then maybe we could listen to DynamoDB streams to see when something changes and have another Lambda called that then might send an email or put something in a queue. And as you start to build these different services together, using your Lambda as the point to move things around, you start to write a lot less code. And you create resilient architectures with clear architectural maps defining what you can do. It also provides a lot more capabilities to your application. So for example, and I promise not to go through all of these, 
these are all of the application services within AWS, but there are lots of application services in the world you could use, like Stripe for payments, for example. And just with a few lines of code, you can hook in machine learning. So if you wanted to use language translation or sentiment analysis or image analysis, you can do that with, with really very little effort. You have the Internet of Things or analytics or media. Or my favorite, uh, building web or mobile apps at scale. So in my former life, we built apps for tens of thousands of users without ever touching a single server, just by using tools like these. So the question comes, how do you use serverless? I get this, this question a lot. And you know, serverless isn't a panacea. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that every, every particular application in the world should be a serverless application. But many applications are a good fit. And we find over and over, when, you, when we look at people who are having success with this, they tend to fall into these sorts of categories. So web apps are great, because just with the nature of the way with spars and the way that they work, it seems like single page application frameworks were made for this kind of architecture. Backends for mobile, um, IoT, apps and services. Uh, data processing is a particularly good example. So some, some of the fastest data processing examples in the world right now run on Lambda. And it's not because Lambda is amazing, it's because of the parallelization that happens, where you can split a problem up and run things all at the same time. So we see a lot of people who have asynchronous data processing use cases that use Lambda with a lot of success. Uh, chatbots and Alexa. So if you have one of those um, Echo devices at home, it comes with a set of skills that you can program, which are like apps for Alexa. And whenever you speak to one of those things, it's actually triggering a Lambda function in the background. So if you write an, an Alexa skill, you only need to focus on that one user who's asking questions to your app. And the fact <laughs> it can be downloaded to millions of devices around the world it actually is just all done for you. And then there's IT automation. So most companies that are using the cloud in some way have some sort of very custom way they want to manage or monitor their cloud infrastructure. And your cloud providers give you ways of monitoring, but it tends not to be exactly what you're looking for. So we have people who've set up very, very elaborate policy engines and management systems using Lambda. They might want to know when an EC2 instance has been turned on and off, or somebody's done something, and they can manage that all serverlessly. So what are the, some of the best practices? This is a an interesting topic because when I first started with serverless, I made every mistake there is you can possibly make. And over time, I've asked people who've been successful with this, you know, what did they think made all the difference? And so I've distilled that into this, this one slide. The first is avoiding a lift and shift. So this is a paradigm shift that I think is like going from mainframe to client server, that you know, you're not going to take the COBOL and run it on your PC. And it's the same with this. Although there are frameworks out there that want to help you pick up Express or Flask frameworks and drop them straight into Lambda, you're not really getting the benefits of serverless. And you have to take some time to figure out how to break out your app and use different services to get what you want out of the system. The second is focusing on events. So with Lambda and with serverless providers in general, you're paying for time. And as developers, this is a kind of a weird concept, because if you pay for an EC2 instance or a server under your desk, you've got this box, and it's yours. Like, if it's doing something or nothing, who cares? And so you're accustomed to writing code that can sleep and wait and do these sorts of things. Now, in Lambda, you're, the, the clock is running when the Lambda function is running. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to have conditions where lambdas call lambdas, or they're calling another service and waiting for something to come back. And so you have to reorient your thinking around this time factor. And the easiest way to do that is to think about events when you structure your application. Um, I tend to think you can go from like flowchart and whiteboard to design almost more easily, because you can go, well, my application, this file arrives here, and that triggers these things, much like the diagram I showed earlier. The other thing around these is that functions are ephemeral and stateless, which is also a new thing to lots of developers. So you don't want things to be stateful. And I've read a lot of articles about hacking Lambda to make it remember things from previous invocations. But you don't actually want to do this, because you don't know when it's going to be called or by how many people. And the service in the background can scale up your invocations very aggressively. Um, and the future concurrent functions don't know about what happened before. So you want to make sure you stay stateless in your thinking. This is a question I get asked a lot. How big should my function be? And I had somebody show me a couple of months back 
a function that was 50,000 lines long. And I, yeah, like, I don't, I just can't deal with that. So I think the, that for a Lambda function, if you go above about 100 lines of code, you have to have a good reason. And it's the same with length of execution. Although Lambda can let you run for 15 minutes, in reality, if you're going above a few seconds, you've got to wonder why you're doing that. Are you missing something? Is there a better way to do this? Uh, one of the common ones I see is people uploading from the mobile apps uh, objects into S3, and they do it via a Lambda function. And of course, you're waiting for the length of time that it takes because of bandwidth on the phone and other things, and you're paying all the time. And you don't need to do any of that. You could just actually just upload directly to S3 and not call Lambda at all. So you want to avoid this monolithic function idea, as tempting as it is, because we've all come from that world, and really focus on breaking these functions down into small units that you can manage, typically 50 to 100 lines of code. And in my former projects, I found that actually this finally led to code reuse. You could find that once you'd done three or four different projects, you were pulling functions from other projects and moving those around pretty easily. So I like this one. So, you know, in technology, everybody's got their favorite runtime and programming language. You know, I'm a Python person. I'm a Node person. And when I first started this, we were a Python shop, and we ended up going to Node, which at the time seemed like heresy. You know, people couldn't believe it. But there's definitely better tools and better runtimes for different parts of your application. So if you have data processing chunks in your application, you probably want to use Python. If you have things that require really fast execution, you might want to use Go. If you're hand handing JSON around all day long, um, then Node is a good choice. But unlike the previous world we came from, where we basically had to take teams of developers and make them all use the same runtime, now you can use whatever you like. So essentially, pick the right tool for the job. There's no restriction. So treat the code like plumbing. And this is, a, this is an interesting idea that takes a while to start with people, because we're not used to doing this. You need to learn about four or five different services with your cloud provider. You know, what's the database? What's the API gateway? Where's the object storage? And learn how those use, uh, learn how those work, and then learn how to uh, connect them using your code. This is probably the thing I see people take the longest to do. It takes about six months of building these things to realize that you're doing the work of one of these services, and that's not the, not the best approach. And then if you're doing this in a company where you're trying to convince people that serverless is the way to go, you've got to find the right place to start. So in my career, I've had a long career of being the first person in the room saying, we should do cloud. And everyone's like, no one will ever trust cloud, because I was 10 years too early. Or I was saying, you know, we should make it so that you can buy things on your phone. People love your phone. And people, then people said, no, 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 no one's ever going to trust their phone to buy things. And it's the same with serverless now. If you go into a lot of companies, there's a feeling that it's too soon or it's not ready. So if, you, if you've tried it and you like it, the best thing to do is find the right application fit. So I started with cron jobs. You know, I had things that were running and going wrong at 2 in the morning and waking me up. And I was able to convert those to Lambda functions I could use. And then from there, I, I transitioned into working on data processing work, where just boring jobs, I could, I could understand the mechanics of serverless. And it wasn't until I'd done quite a few of these projects that I went for a full-scale web application uh, where it's much more complicated. And you know, while not all applications should be serverless, typically I've found that some part of all applications can be serverless. So you know, things like user administration, logging, um, jobs that happen inside the app, there's always something in there that you can make operate serverlessly. And generally, for developers, that basically makes your life a lot easier. So I promised a revolution in my session title. And I used the word really carefully and deliberately. I believe serverless is not an incremental change, as we see with lots of technology. I think it's a revolution in the way we approach developing things. It radically and fundamentally changes many aspects of development. So how is that? Well, I think there are four fundamental factors. The first is agility. How fast can your piece of software respond to the needs of its users? And with the explosion of mobile apps and consumer apps, yeah, we found that the number of requirements coming in are getting faster and faster, and it's not slowing down. You know, With serverless, having less code, 
your apps become a federation of different Lambda functions and services, and it makes them very lightweight and easy to change. So when you make those mistakes earlier in the application, the mistakes you couldn't avoid because you didn't know what the requirements are, it's fundamentally easier to pivot your application into something else. And of course, with no infrastructure to manage, even if you make the wrong database call, and you pick one database, and you should have picked another one, switching it down the road is that much easier. The second is scaling, which I just cannot emphasize enough. So we've got applications in the world now that have tens of millions of users. That's crazy. I mean, it's just an enormous number of people. And this scale creates uniquely hard engineering problems that are very tough to solve. There are really only you know, a handful of companies in the world that truly understand scaling. And it's a hard and expensive problem to try and solve this by yourself. So companies have unpredictable workloads, and you can run things like TV ads, not knowing how many people will hit the website or the web app when those are run. And so even seasoned DevOps people co get caught out with this when you're managing auto scaling. You know, often you, in the non-serverless world, you'll build out your scaling plan, and it's only when you first get truly hammered you realize that it wasn't what you thought it would be. So it's a tough problem. And for startups, I think it's an even tougher problem because if you're building MVPs, minimum viable products, it's very hard to build scaling into that application by definition. Your application should be doing MVP. It should be doing the one thing you're selling to your users. And typically, I've seen that you, know, you push out an application, it becomes wildly successful, and then it falls over because you've not figured out the scaling. So as a startup, you have this problem pre-serverless. You know, do I invest in scaling up front and maybe lose the, prob lose the ability to, to pivot later if the idea isn't right? Or do I not bother and, and try to cobble it together when there's a problem? So serverless solves this problem. And actually, before I was at AWS, this was one of the reasons I got into this, because we built lots of MVPs for people. And of course, our customers never told us when they went to scale. And we could see how those MVPs survived this scaling effect. The third aspect is cost. Now, co your IT is expensive. It's not just the boxes we buy. You've got uh, networking, r rooms these things live in, air conditioning, power is expensive. Um, and then, of course, there's headcount. For all of your applications, you've got people who are specialists in each line of work. You've, there's networking and uh, databases, security, and so on and so forth. So cloud has helped a lot with this and you know, made a big difference compared to on-prem but you might still be paying for things that you're not using. It's very easy in the EC2 world to find your running instances that just are not running at 100%. And if, you, if you've got a server you, that's not running 100%, then you're essentially not getting everything you paid for. So with serverless, cost is much more attributable to usage. And if you're building things like SaaS applications, suddenly it's a lot easier to figure out which one of your customers is costing you the most as well. So you can directly attribute that cost. So one example I found here, I, I really like this one, because cost is one of those subjects where, like, who cares as developers, because we don't pay the bill. But um, A Cloud Guru, the training platform, they were one of the first all serverless uh, environments to be built. And I checked this a week ago. So they scaled to 40,000 users in their first six months with no servers. Today they've got over one million students who have gone through their training. And their entire infrastructure consists of 43 microservices, 287 functions being called 7.7 .7 million times a day, and this whole system runs for less than $10,000 a month. So the fourth aspect is the environment, and I think this is a key one that probably most people in this room are aware of. A lot of companies now have <laughs> enormous pressure for, for engineering talent. We simply don't have enough people all the time. And there aren't enough people in the world learning all these skills to plug that gap. So we have a, a constant problem where there's more work. Most companies are leaning on IT for more and more for us to do. And yet we don't have more headcount. So you see these things like DevOps, SecOps, FinTechOps, the 10x developer. All of these phrases basically mean more work for you. So tools like this let you offload a lot of this heavy lifting that's very difficult to manage. And Basically, you can go back to focusing on the features of your software, because typically, that's going to keep you busy enough without thinking about all the other stuff. So I truly think this is a rev revolution. And I'm really pleased that a lot of you are here to take this journey with me to see where it goes in the next couple of years. 
My name is James Berzik. I'll be here for the rest of the conference the rest of the day, so please feel free to ask me questions you like. But thanks very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here at IT Next. Hey, I want to say again thanks to uh, James, and we go for the break and then the open spaces. So enjoy. <laughs>